Hello, and welcome to today's deep dive on the topic of alternative proteins to meet the growing demand. Today, we are joined by Dr. William Chen of Nanyang Technological University, who will provide our keynote address. We will then have a panel discussion with Isabel de Citre, founder and CEO of ID Capital, Varun Deshpande from the Good Food Institute, and Neil Ian Lamanlan, a circular bioeconomy consultant. Thank you very much to our speakers for being with us today. So as per capita incomes and populations rise in developing markets, demand for high quality protein will continue to grow. If we consider that meat and fish alone should meet this increased demand, let's consider what that entails. Animal and aquaculture industries rely currently on fish meal and soy in particular to provide protein to animals, and that protein is essential for their growth. However, the production of fish meal is stagnant at around 5 million tonnes and comes mostly from wild catch. Production of soybean meal is at around 250 million tonnes, and that's by far the dominant protein used in animal and aquafeed. However, soy can produce at best around 1.3 million tonnes, sorry, 1.3 tonnes of protein per hectare per year. So to increase soy production for animal feed would require land use change, and we can't really produce increased production of fish meal. So new proteins are clearly urgently needed for animal feeds. Or could we just ask everyone to eat less animal products? That seems like a simple solution, but I'm sure our audience knows that it's much more complicated than that. We've got a lot to discuss today, and I'm not going to provide all of the answers because I think our panelists have got a lot to say. So let's dive in with our keynote address from Dr. William Chen. Thank you, William. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, EDB and uh, uh, ADB, sorry, and in particular, uh, Prof. Zhang for inviting me uh, to give an uh, address here. And uh, um, maybe I would uh, just mount a slide on my side. Can you all see the slide? Yes. You can see the slide? Yes, Professor. All right, good. Uh, we'll go to the... Well, uh, so as uh, Kate uh, just mentioned, um, the developing alternative uh, protein and food uh, is a pressing issue uh, in the in the context of a growing po uh, world population and the higher increased demand for nutrition and food, and also the disruption of uh, supply chain food supply chain uh, due to external factors like um, um, climate change. Uh, COVID-19 pandemic and uh, late, uh, re more recently, the war in Ukraine. So I would uh, um, cover a, a number of topics here within the next uh, 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, first of all, uh, current food system and the need and constraint, uh, I think more or less uh, uh, summarized by Kate just now, and, uh, and the need for this uh, alternative food and uh, what, what is a demand or is related to current food system um, and the prospect of this alternative food um, and uh, uh, how to develop this alternative food is another interesting question. So instead of reinventing the wheel, I think uh, we can see this uh, development of uh, alternative food as a complementary element to the to the current food system uh, to improve it and to uh, sort of create this uh, circular food circular economy model and uh, as i mentioned efficiency is uh, very important which means that uh, um, we can actually rely on some of the simple technology innovation so i would just use a uh, uh, some of the innovation that we have developed in Singapore as a uh, uh, case in point. Otherwise, everything is uh, is a, a little bit too general. Yeah. And uh, this would, uh, uh, I will conclude with uh, um, the uh, perspective on the future food system uh, in terms of efficiency and sustainability. 
Yeah. So what you see here on the right hand side is more like why the current food system is not so efficient, uh, largely because it's, uh, we operate uh, for many years uh, using this uh, linear model. So generate a lot of waste along the way. And uh, uh, so therefore the pressure on the system uh, with uh, all these uh, demand and requirement is tremendous and uh, is not sustainable in long run. So what we are looking for is what we see at the bottom. Uh, we can skip the details, but more like uh, efficient than circular. Uh, so to maximize the resources available. Uh, and some, uh, some of the alternative food that I mentioned here, which I would uh, discuss briefly. Okay, so uh, I think this is uh, um, now become a common sense with the uh, participant at this uh, important uh, forum. Uh, I will not need to repeat, uh, basically with uh, uh, increase in world population and uh, um, more importantly, uh, more than 70% of the world population will now move into urban areas. So that actually increased the uh, pressure on the supply chain on the traditional farming uh, practice as well. And, uh, and the increase of, uh, uh, in the food demand is, uh, is very obvious with this increase in world population. So as I mentioned um, earlier, and also Kate has mentioned, um, sustain this uh, life's current livestock farming uh, is very difficult because of all these uh, issues associated with uh, uh, growing crops to 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 such a feed the animals and then the animal farming on the the impact on the environment uh, so this is uh, clearly not sustainable uh, in addition we are also facing some external uh, um, impact um, changes that are beyond our control. Like, uh, well, we are actually part of the cause for these changes sometimes, uh, like climate change, COVID-19. Uh, so all this exposed the, the current food system, the, the weakness, weak, weak side of this current food system are, are, are very clearly exposed uh, uh, these days. So we can see it's a very fragile. Uh, COVID-19, the, the restriction of uh, human movement clearly exposed that the food supply chain is very fragile. And uh, uh, food waste, 10 years ago, not many people mentioned about this uh, food waste uh, problem, but we see this as a very important uh, a gap to, to be filled. Um, just like uh, we, if we go to kitchen, we on the water tap, we don't use the water. So no amount of water is enough. So likewise, if we do not uh, address this food waste issue, no amount of uh, uh, crops or, or fish through aquaculture uh, will be enough to, to fulfill our requirement. So um, the urgent need is to uh, uh, build an efficient and sustainable um, uh, food system. And the uh, alternative food uh, there comes is naturally into the picture. It provides a, us with uh, new options. Okay, so when we talk about alternative food, um, there are a lot of uh, different um, uh, sort of proponents, some more towards urban farming type of food, some uh, more towards GM, uh, uh, GMO or, uh, and things like that. So uh, if we look at this alternative food as a whole, we can see actually it covers pretty wide. The, the key point here is that the urban farming cultivated meat should not be considered as the only option. We, sh we can look into the nature, like underutilized crop. Uh, example here is uh, um, this uh, Bambara uh, groundnut. Uh, and so these are the regionally available, um, naturally occurring uh, crops, which are resilient to climate change. So uh, they are equally nutritious. So um, we can uh, consider these uh, naturally um, uh, available uh, sources. Plant-based protein is very much uh, on everybody's uh, uh, in everybody's discussion. Uh, this one I would uh, uh, later on I would uh, discuss further. Uh, microbial protein, right? So this is uh, uh, again um, uh, suitable and cultivated meat. All these are suitable for urban farming setup, and uh, uh, you can see some of the example. Uh, the, in, in time to come, we will see cultivated meat. Uh, uh, be part of this uh, uh, beef steak that we are familiar with. 
uh, already this uh, plant-based uh, chicken nugget has been launched in Singapore um, uh, a, few, uh, a while ago. And the last one is the insect protein, right? So um, this is, a, again, is a naturally, occur, uh, is a natural and uh, suitable for urban farming. So you can see another encouraging side. This is a report from uh, the Good Food Institute that is a, a lot of attention investment are being poured in into this space. Okay, so uh, if we look at the, the uh, slightly deeper at the plant-based um, uh, alternative protein. So these are some of the definition plant-based meat. Uh, it can be uh, unprocessed form and processed form. So this, like, this leads us to the question of uh, this uh, uh, is uh, alternative um, uh, meat a hyper-processed uh, uh, a product. So how to how will consumer react to this? And uh, uh, some of these uh, other type of alternative food may or may not be well uh, perceived by consumers. If they, it's very culturally linked. If you ask everyone in the world to start eating insect, there may be a, a issue. But if I ask people who have been uh, consuming ins uh, uh, insect protein as part of the diet, like in Thailand and, uh, and other countries, so that, that, that's easier to conceive. Uh, so the consumer education is very important. So I show you an example here. Um, that some of the uh, areas for consideration that I think uh, the panel will be discussing uh, about. Uh, first is uh, uh, supply sources. We talk about this uh, um, alternative protein, uh, plant-based uh, protein. So where are the uh, protein coming from, right? Uh, are they coming from the uh, current crop farming or we need we need to do some convincing of the smallholder farmer for them to switch um, the, to the new type of crop farming and what is the impact on their livelihood. And the urban farming, right? What kind of uh, 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 sort of uh, plant-based uh, uh, crop that we, we, we need to consider for the urban farming setup. And uh, the cost of production and, and processing, in the, especially in the urban uh, uh, setup, urban farming setup, uh, we know we need to process to take the protein out. So instead of, uh, as opposed to the vegetarian diet, the plant-based protein is actually rich in protein. And another important point, I think it will be part of the panel discussion is a nutrition profile and balance, right? And uh, here is some example that which shows that the uh, protein content uh, is a very a lot from, from one type of uh, crop to another. So this is a, uh, what is the best selection? That is something we need to discuss. And balance here, uh, what I'm trying to say is that protein is not everything that we should consider because uh, like we eat, if we ask consumer to eat plant-based chicken breast, it's dry, it's rich in protein, but it's not very tasty. So here we need to consider other type of element like uh, 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 minerals, micronutrients, and, and lipid, right? Uh, how sustainable are these, are these other ingredients into this uh, development of uh, alternative uh, product? This is also part of our consideration. And when we talk about the plant-based uh, alternative food, obviously allergenicity and the safety is also onto our uh, uh, mind. And consumer education, as I mentioned earlier, not all the consumers are, are well aware of this uh, alternative protein. And some of some of the consumers we, which are well informed, they may not, they may not, they may be skeptical about this uh, uh, novel food. So, uh, in partnership with the uh, uh, Food Institute, uh, my university has uh, launched this uh, new undergraduate. Uh, course to educate the uh, uh, consumer from young age, right? Uh, it's not just about education, also training manpower. And lastly, is uh, regulatory approval. Okay, so this one is about the uh, uh, comparison of a different micronutrient and the micronutrient uh, between the animal source and plant source. You can see the uh, they can be very different. And uh, this one I already shown before. So the choosing the right protein source is very important, right? And we need to consider all these uh, points that I mentioned in the previous slide. And now in the uh, uh, last few minutes, I just quickly mentioned, how can we build the efficient food system uh, uh, and, uh, and couple with the alternative protein development? I will not go into detail of this slide. Basically, this shows that the food waste is a serious problem across Asia. I will not mention about 
uh, the worldwide situation. But in Asia, this is a, 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 a very serious challenge. If we can reduce food waste to the maximum, then actually the pressure on primary production uh, will be a lot lower. And then uh, we will also have uh, more time to sort of uh, use this technology to develop this alternative food space. Uh, this is uh, some of the issue associated with food waste in terms of uh, how much has been wasted and uh, what is the impact, impact, negative impact on the environment. I think uh, the panelists here are all well aware of this. This, uh, this side shows a proportion of food waste in red in different countries, Singapore being uh, uh, relatively uh, lower in this, part, but as a whole, you can see that the uh, uh, food waste is a serious problem and needs to be tackled. So um, the last two minutes about the challenges, um, the, how we develop uh, Singapore's, uh, uh, how we have developed innovation to address uh, food security in Singapore. So there are three areas one is we have very little land for farming. Second, we generate, like many other countries in the region, we generate a lot of food waste. Third is the aging population. So all three combined actually a part and parcel of the what we consider single food security. So uh, food waste is a, a serious issue. We take this approach to develop simple technology to also sort of uh, uh, address this issue. And uh, this summarize uh, what we have done. Uh, so uh, basically two approaches in combination. One is to develop natural food preservative, which uh, extend the shelf life of food produced, therefore leading to the reduced generation of food waste. Second is to take value out of the food waste and then convert the remaining residue into usable material. So as a whole, we generate a food circular economy. So you may ask, what do we do with this nutrient recover, right? This is what we consider upcycling exercise. So we can show that uh, this uh, uh, fermenter side stream, okara, for example, can replace uh, cultural medium uh, a lot for a lot of urban farming practices. In this case, it's a protein-rich microalgae farming. Uh, by replacing the cultural medium, we achieve ninefold improvement, including threefold cost reduction. Uh, the, the second one is that uh, when we move uh, a, a step further, uh, then we can extract the new uh, protein ingredient from this uh, fermented soybean residue and then replace animal origin ingredient in the current uh, product. In this case, we have successfully made the uh, develop a plant based uh, mayonnaise uh, using uh, a, a fermented barley spank green. And these are some of the residues, uh, uh, solid residue conversion into useful materials, including packaging material, bandages, and uh, uh, even antimicrobial masks that I will now elaborate further. Uh, this is uh, my um, uh, last slide. Uh, basically, we, we see that the, there's a strong need. Uh, it's a shared respons responsibility to uh, enhance this uh, food system. It's not just a government side. It's not just private side. We need to build this public-private partnership. And the food circular economy, you can see that the, uh, a lot of things can be uh, put into this uh, philosophy, the framework, and the innovation will help uh, uh, greatly. The company mentality refers to how the alternative protein development can actually uh, uh, help us uh, address the, the, the pressure on the primary production of a traditional uh, a food system. And diversity is important. So uh, from farming to processing to uh, end consumer product. And uh, lastly, efficiency and sustainability is a part and parcel of our development because no point developing all the alternative food which are uh, costly and uh, taste no good. So uh, then we will not have a consumer buy in and then uh, we are not helping ourselves. So with this, uh, uh, I will see that uh, we, we, we would like to see this diversity of future diet and then our uh, farming practice and the food system changing from linear to circular in the near future. Thank you for your attention. William, that's great. Thank you so much for your address. Um, I think you've touched on some really important points around the diversity of the future diet 
Um, one thing that really struck me on your slides was when you show you were discussing the nutritional um, profiles of various um, food sources and just how many different foods we really need in order to achieve that complete nutritional balance. So um, there's a lot to think of there in terms of food systems um, and public health. Um, you've raised many topics and I think our panelists are ready to dive in. Um, so I'd like to welcome Isabel, Varun and Ian. Um, thank you again for joining us today. What I'd love to know is each of you are working in um, alternative proteins in various ways. We have Isabel who's an investor, we have Varun in a, in a think tank, and we have Ian who's a secular bioeconomy consultant. What motivates you personally to work in this space? Isabel, could we start with you? Sure. Thank you very much, Kate, for having me today. So I would like to change your question a little bit, if I may. Sure. The <laughs> question is, why am I still interested in alternative proteins? I started in this space in 2014, and I can't believe it's been already seven years. I'm busy scrutinizing every possible kind of species of algae, mushroom, insect, precision fermentation, and, and the likes. I've really seen the food evolution. It's absolutely mind-blowing. So in 2014, these were very, very rare discussions on very esoteric topics. People were not so knowledgeable about it, and it was definitely not a layman's discussion. It was starting in the US, in Europe. Gradually, we saw Asia coming in. Within Asia, we see today that there are two countries moving massively in this direction. Um, Singapore, Australia, India, just by its sheer size. And very interestingly, at the beginning, it was a matter of startups, which was also my bread and butter, but gradually it became a matter of larger companies. The nature of the challenge has also evolved massively. Knowing some subsectors like precision fermentation, it's about uh, building capabilities. You see full biorefinery concepts coming off the ground in microalgae. You're not opposing any more biofuels and astaxanthin. It's all about producing everything, including protein, in an economical manner. You have fungi and mushrooms coming in, so it's difficult not to be excited about it. That's great. Thank you. Um, Ian? Ian, would you like to jump in? Yeah. Um, <laughs> hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, um, much like uh, Professor um, Chen, uh, I'm, I'm also a microbiologist by training and education. So uh, there's a couple of things that, um, that really drives me to work in alternative proteins. And number one would be climate change. Uh, I survived life-threatening super typhoons twice, once uh, in my first year of marriage, and then second when I had my first son. So um, I survived uh, ty super typhoon Ketsana when it um, um, destroyed many cities in Manila, and uh, hundreds of people died, including children. Seeing the uh, images of of dead children being, um, you know, um, recovered by rescuers uh, made me think uh, hard uh, of the future of my children. So there are things that we can do three times a day. We can contribute to to reversing global warming three times a day with our food choices. Um, and uh, ancient American civilizations less, left us a model of of regenerative agriculture with which they were able to thrive through four climate disruptions uh, for the past 3,000 years before the Spaniards came. They have used fire and organic waste to create the most fertile soil in the earth. And that is found in the uh, Amazon basin. Um, so it's rich in carbon and organic waste. And to this day, uh, it's highly valued in Brazil uh, that even uh, farmers are selling this kind of black earth called terra preta. So it's very valuable and it's uh, even uh, transported very far pl uh, places. So uh, they were able to uh, harvest water and grow fish and vegetables organ uh, hydrophonically. 
and they use the symbiosis of corn, beans, and squash, and also eat a variety of proteins, including uh, different sources, uh, different plants, uh, mushrooms, insects, and algae, in addition to livestock. So um, the only way we can reverse global warming is by pulling carbon back into the ground through plants and microorganisms. And we can store it permanently with, uh, with biochar technologies. Uh, so uh, farmers today, they, they burn a lot of crop residues and it contributes to global warming. But if that uh, energy can be captured to, to be used in processing, post-harvest processing of, of crop waste, then uh, we can sidestep the use of fossil fuels in agriculture. And then we can also sequester half of the carbon in uh, arable lands of, of this planet. And um, billions of farmers can do this with our support and with very simple and low cost technologies. So that's my take on why I still work on alternative proteins today. Very interesting. And that's a very broad context as well and a broad motivation um, and very personal. Thank you for sharing the stories. Um, I might pass over to Varun to hear from your perspective as well, just to keep moving. And I'm sure we'll return to many of these questions. Varun, can I ask why you personally are motivated to work in alternative proteins? Yeah, thank you so much, Kate. And thanks, uh, ADB, for having us as well. I think I'm going to echo Professor Chen's and Neil's and Isabel's comments here. For me personally, and for us at the Good Food Institute network of organizations, we deeply care about the question of feeding 10 billion people by the year 2050, right? As, as we all do in the audience here today and on this panel. Uh, and of course, when we think about feeding 10 billion people by 2050, about 50% 50 of those people are still going to be in Asia. Right? So we have to be particularly mindful about building something that's more sustainable, secure, and, and safe uh, as a food system. So uh, our aim of focusing on industrial animal agriculture and providing a viable alternative through alternative proteins uh, is exactly focusing on that question. Because people have been saying for decades that we should eat chickpeas, not chicken, or eat broccoli, not beef. And um, that doesn't seem to be working, right? People are eating more meat than ever before. And that has severe implications in terms of land use, water use, greenhouse gas emissions, ocean dead zones, ocean acidification, biodiversity loss, species loss, all of the things that we all care about, plus antimicrobial resistance, potential zoonotic pandemics, food insecurity, et cetera. Just to pull this to myself a little bit as well, having grown up in India, um, seeing a little bit of the kind of vulnerability that exists uh, in our populations, particularly in light of COVID-19. I think we've all seen uh, pictures of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people who are essentially pandemic refugees uh, traveling from cities like Mumbai back to their villages uh, because transportation was locked down. We've also seen climate refugees in, in various parts of the world, especially places like Somalia. Um, I think we're all getting a picture of what the future might look like if we do not build resiliency into our food systems today. And with only now seven-ish years left to achieve the sustainable development goals, I think we don't have time to waste. So with so many, um, so many challenges in the future and sort of being balanced on this knife edge between scarcity and abundance, I think alternative proteins represents an, an extremely promising solution or a way of addressing several of these problems. Excellent, thanks so much, Varun. Um, so one of the problems that we know we have in our current food system is reliance on soy as a protein source for animal feed, and I mentioned this in the introduction. How can we avoid repeating this pattern when we're creating a new landscape in alternative proteins? Um, Isabel, may I ask you all thoughts on this question? Yeah, sure. There are many answers to these questions. I think first, it's fair to say that the issue with soy is first and foremost an issue of biodiversity, because in terms of nutritional value, cost, soy is pretty efficient. In this part of the world, there is not so much the stigma on the allergenicity of soy. So soy is not all bad, but this dominant monoculture has been having many, many perverse effects. One of the answers is pulses. 
One of the answers is legumes, chickpeas, fava bean, mung beans, and maybe one statistic to keep in mind. Asia Pacific is host to 49% of the production of pulses. And it gives us hope because that's really where we could see the region embracing not just more farming of those pulses, but the processing of them. So if you want to break it down within this 49 person, you will have a massive proportion, which is in India, I think 57 person. And then you will have number two and three, Myanmar and China. Myanmar is a sudden situation. If Myanmar had been able to leverage the potential of their pulse farming potential, that would have been a game changer. But globally speaking, and we even produced a report last year on the pulses opportunity in Asia. I think there is this notion of owning this pulse processing step in the value chain, this kind of mess middle where the crop is farmed in the country, sent to another country to be processed, reincorporated in the diet. It's not efficient. It doesn't bring any upside to the farmers in the country farming these crops. These crops are a very big part of the equation, whether they are just farmed for their own merits or as a rotational crop. And we see this more and more. We are working with Taiwan in Thailand. They are working on rotation crops for their cassava. We see fava bean emerging, we see lupin uh, emerging, and not just for feed. Everything that ties in with carbon sequestration and soil health, I think, should be our North Star. So it's not just replacing soil, it's finding solutions that are more comprehensive and holistic, not just something that is providing the protein fix in a patty. Excellent, thank you. Um, Ian, may I ask your perspective on that question? Yeah, um, um, Isabel mentioned um, crop rotations with uh, pulses and legumes um, in with uh, major uh, crop systems like cassava and other major commodities. So um, uh, with regards to soybeans um, and its um, association with biodiver biodiversity loss due to um, land co conversion. Um, I think we have to also leverage the nitrogen fixing capacity of legumes and um, other, um, other nitrogen fixing uh, or, uh, plants such as azola and so that uh, we can enhance biological nitrogen fixation in these croplands and uh, sidestep the use of fossil-based nitrogen. Second, um, we can enhance synergy among um, various uh, alternative protein sources. So the, the side streams, the organic uh, side streams from processing of, of legumes and pulses can be used to feed um, insects, edible insects and insects used as feed so that we can create a circular economy. And the frass, which are uh, something like uh, insect uh, leftover, th their poop, um, can be used in combination with microorganisms such as uh, indigenous fungi. And this can enhance the symbiosis of, of native fungi to uh, enhance uh, phosphorus efficiency in the soil so that uh, the next crop will uh, can can produce a, a, a even um, a higher yield without using so much uh, um, chemical fertilizers and then um, uh, the, the 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 application of regenerative practices uh, such as no till and or reduce till of the soil um, as well as composting and um, other regenerative uh, practices and also if we can create a, a systems design approach wherein this alternative protein uh, uh, startups or companies can can have um, an industrial ecology to create synergy and material uh, efficiency so um, and then um, half of the ways again of croplands can be used as their energy source for for 
post-harvest processing. So that, that biomass energy uh, can be used to, rec to process, uh, to dry the crops, the grains, the, the pulses. And then at the same time, you are able to permanently fix carbon in the soil in the form of biochar. And that can remain in the soil for at least 1,000 years. So that's uh, you know multiple uh, bottom line benefits. I think, thank you. And I think this is really important that here we are talking about um, alternative proteins, but we're not um, avoiding the very important benefits that a new landscape for alternative proteins can actually create um, by bringing um, climate change resilience, improved soil health, improved productivity, reduced reliance on synth synthetic fertilizers. And we can achieve those things by increasing the production of certain proteins, which I think is, is really interesting. Varun, anything to add? Yeah, and I will, I'll echo your comments, Kate, because I think that I love that we're talking about agronomic practices that, that align well with uh, an overall push to, I guess, steward soil health and, and improve the prospects of, of smallholder farmers in that way. And um, just to underline this point, I mean, 50% of India's population is reliant on agriculture for their livelihood and their and you know their, their income that that number is 41 percent in indonesia it is it is quite large across this region right i will say just to offer an alternative perspective as well in terms of reducing reliance on soy which as you said is the primary crop uh, that's used to feed animals which are then used to um to, to procure meat and milk etc uh, there are other categories of alternative proteins right so professor chen brought these up uh, and Isabel as well. The idea here is that we have these three big bucket, three big buckets within alternative proteins. We have plant-based proteins, fermentation-derived proteins, and then you have cultivated meat. And of course, uh, roughly in that order of how close they are to market, right? So there is this opportunity to diversify our inputs of protein into the system uh, in ways that consumers will want to actually eat those products as well. Uh, but do, diving a little bit deeper, once again, into the plant-based side, I just want to highlight the role of innovation in being able to diversify away from crops like soy. So some of the work that we've been doing in countries like India is to do deep research characterizing some of the crops that we're talking about. So whether they're pulses, millets, hemp, etc. Uh, we need to understand more deeply uh, their genomic parameters, their agronomic practices, their food science parameters and how they perform in these next generation food products, because we actually don't have this information available to hand, which makes it really difficult for entrepreneurs to come in and use these products to make, uh, use these crops rather to make next generation food products, right? So unless I know how a crop is going to behave in a plant-based egg formulation or a plant-based meat formulation, I'm not gonna be able to uh, make a great product. I'm not gonna be able to choose my crop or the varietal of that crop well. And then also that results in a number of additives needing to be added later on. Whereas what we can do over time is make the, the labels cleaner, we can benefit farmers if we invest in innovation to understand these crops much better. And there are great examples out there in the market. For example, the, the just egg, which is made from mung beans. Mung beans have been grown on this subcontinent in India for about 4,000 years, but it took a company from San Francisco uh, to drive all of this interest in the mung bean as a, as a uh, as a crop of interest in plant-based eggs, right? And just one final point here, governments in places like India are trying to diversify uh, crops in use, right? Crops under acreage, Kate. So like uh, the use of cash crops like wheat and rice and sugarcane in this part of the world has had major benefits in terms of economic impacts for farmers. But at this stage, we do need to re reevaluate our kind of portfolio of, of crops under acreage, right? So. Uh, we're not going to be able to actually get farmers to grow other crops like pulses unless we have a lucrative end market into which they can sell those crops. And this is where plant-based proteins and plant-based meat, et cetera, come in. Because if you're able to, able to actually provide sustained, guaranteed offtake for those farmers, you can do end-to-end -end value chain development. So these are the, the big questions we're evaluating and delighted to work with anyone on any of these things. Great. Thanks, Ron. Um, there are some aspects of your um, comments just now that I'd like to return to in a moment. But firstly, just picking up on something you mentioned around additives. And one criticism that I hear quite often um, of alternative proteins is, is on the nutritional aspects. And I know that um, William has certainly provided 
um, a lot of information on this. But some of the alternative proteins that are available today do have quite a, um, a high sodium content or they may be highly processed. Um, or as we were just saying earlier, they may also lack the complete amino acid profile and the micronutrients that um, animal proteins might be able to provide. So how can advocates of alternative proteins respond to these criticisms? And we can think about this either as, an, as alternative proteins are today or where we think alternative proteins might be in five to 10 years time. Veron, can I hand it back to you? Yeah, thank you, Kate. And I think you actually answered the question, right? I think. <laughs> I th Sorry. I think, I think the I think the primary uh, way of addressing this, and I think it's a very good question, and I think people should be questioning what they're putting into their bodies, right? Um, the primary way to answer this question is that this is an industry that's very much in its infancy, with maybe the fastest iteration cycle we've ever seen in food, and that's not coming from me. That's coming from people at the likes of Unilever, etc., who've been in food for 20 to 40 years who are saying, we've never seen something move faster than this in terms of how quickly the formulations are getting better in terms of clean label, more nutritive uh, ingredients being added, et cetera. Of course, it's all a matter of how can we add more nutrition in, take out some of the stuff that people don't want in there, like binders, methyl cellulose, et cetera, uh, while still keeping the cost where it is. And that's gonna take some time, right? I will once again underline that we do need to work on innovation and funding research in this area. People like Professor Chen have done fantastic work in this area, right, to improve the labels over time. At this stage, we are reliant on ingredients, uh, feedstocks and ingredients that are coming in from other industries. So we're reliant on soy protein isolates that are actually a side stream of the edible oil industry or the animal feed industry, right? So these are things that we really need to work on, um, you know, upstream as well. There are ways in which we can improve the way these proteins are extracted. We can improve circularity and sustainability through the entire value chain. Uh, and all of this was really and is already resulting in cleaner labels over time. Uh, and then just finally, you know, even where we are today, Kate, some of these formulations uh, are inherently better for certain health conditions. So if you look at any of the studies that are now coming out from places like Stanford Medical, uh, you'll see that because plant-based proteins do not contain cholesterol, for instance, they're already today much better for people who have heart disease. If you just swap in a Beyond Burger, right, which, which does have 14 to 21 ingredients on the label, but if you swap in a Beyond Burger, if you were eating a beef burger earlier, all of your parameters in terms of um, heart disease risk and other cardiovascular indicators will improve. That's just pretty much guaranteed, right? So uh, I just, I did want to add that in as well at the end. That's an interesting, interesting question. Um, some of some of my colleagues and friends are questioning. They ask me, you know, sometimes these products are very um, because they're very processed. Meat is something we've eaten for a long time. It's more natural, um, but. I think, as you've explained, and as as William has also highlighted, there's a lot of um, improvement in that area. And I think it is happening really, really, really rapidly. Isabel, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I would like to state that the science of nutrition is incredibly complex. Huh. The base level, it's very simple. But as soon as you want to dig into it, it's very complex and there is no shortcut. So at least if one thing, if the consumers start to read the labels and question what they are eating, it's already a plus. And just sticking to the basics would do already a great job in balancing the diet. What I would like to stress also is that you don't, you don't build a healthy diet meal by meal. It's the average over one day, one week, but of course you can eat chips. Of course you, of course you can eat what is so-called junk food. It's fine, it's also an indulgence. It's really over a certain duration of time that you build a healthy diet. So, as a, as a basic consumer, you have every reason to be lost. And that's why consumers re, re, resort to taste, price, convenience first. And then they start to question things I don't believe they've ever questioned before. Like who's ever heard about binders and methyl cellulose before we threw it in the public debate? But it's been used out there for decades. It's nothing new. It's not even the monopoly of plant-based food. 
So suddenly these discussions happen and it's a very good thing. Um, yeah, really the science of nutrition is a very, very budding sector and it's good if we have more people, more resources coming into that space. I would also like to add that in many parts of Asia, a healthy diet is still synonymous with animal proteins. So it also depends on where you're coming from. I think we are trying to replace the bad calories of the, the not so good animal meat. And it's the vast majority of the volumes of the, eat, the meat that is eaten. You could find carbon neutral beef, you could find some very sheltered domain of the animal supply chain, which are okay for your health, for the environment. But broad stroke, what we're trying to eliminate is the calories that are not really feeding you well and are doing a disaster on the planet. Absolutely. And there are more of those in certain geographies than in others. <laughs> I think that's a very good point. Um, I'm really glad to hear from you that I can continue having a pizza at the end of the working week on Friday nights. I'm so glad you've endorsed that. Thank you. <laughs> You're all good. You can keep going. <laughs> Um, and Isabel, one thing that you touched on there was secularity. Ian, you may have something to add on this question or perhaps something totally different. Yeah, um, with regards to, um, to the question of sodium content, um, well, compared uh, two decades ago or a generation ago, um, pe uh, people are reading labels. Uh, uh, in many Asian countries, edible insects are roasted or fried with not much processing. Just remove the legs and the wings and they hop into the wok. And um, just, don't add, just don't add or don't use too much soy sauce. <laughs> but in the Western world where they hide the insects and use pulverized insect powders as food ingredients. So uh, it's up to the, the formulator or the food technologies in how to bring the, the, the nutritional value of, of insects and how to make it um, delicious. Now, with regards to amino acid profiles of insects, um, the industry uh, as what we did uh, is we balance the, the feedstock for insects so that they will have uh, optimal gra uh, growth rates and feed conversion ratios. So um, we, we also balance the um, carbohydrate to protein ratio. And we also, as much as possible, use different uh, vegetal uh, uh, waste materials. And then we have uh, ways to and, uh, optimize the the amino acid profile of, of the insect uh, diet. So that's how we come up with uh, an end product that has an optimal amino acid profile. Um, so uh, insects are also naturally rich in iron and zinc and also as uh, calcium and phosphorus. So this is beneficial for, uh, for developing nations, especially for young children uh for their growth and development um these um studies have shown that you know insects have a higher iron and zinc compared pound by pound to to beef or other meat so that's a good plus but it is also dependent on the on the feedstock formulation the the, the food waste that we use to feed insects uh and some um, some insect startups they rely on corn and soy, so this is quite an issue. Uh, with the with the um, with the food conversion uh, ratio, and uh, you know um, saying that it is um, the 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 feed consumption of of insects are very, very much less than animals. So they still use some corn and soy. Now, um, corn and soy, of course, will have, uh, will have uh, complementary amino acids uh, that for the growth of the insect. But of course, it, it has to be sourced uh, sustainably. So not 
uh, if it's a sustainable corn and soy, no problem. So we will have a, 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 an, a protein balance, amino acid balance in the insect product. Yeah, I personally um, have had some very tasty insects um, and I agree to have them cooked and flavored very simply. Um, one of the, some of the nice brands that I've seen um, that are promoting insects for human, direct human consumption um, are sort of flavoring them with very simple flavors and encouraging, encouraging them to be eaten as a little snack before meal. So while you're socializing with your friends and I think that gentle social pressure to nudge people who are not used to eating insects um, to do that in a in a friendly social environment is um, is a clever tactic so yeah I'm on board <laughs> um, so we have about 10 minutes left for um, for our panel discussion and we have two more questions we can try to get through um, one is on behavior change so I think we've already touched on this a little bit um, and it's really about taste at the end of the day, taste and cost, I think. So what behavior changes do you think um, are most, in, most urgently required to scale up alternative proteins in Asia? Maybe Varun, could I ask you? Yeah, Kate, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to slightly change the question. Uh, firstly, I fully endorse Isabel's uh, points and yours just now that it all rests on taste and taste and price, right? Like that, that's really how, if we're talking about reliable, sustained consumption across all socioeconomic levels of society, we have to give people something that feels like a simple switch and not a sacrifice. And that means in terms of taste and price and availability, right? Access, convenience, et cetera. And there's a lot that goes into that the right to sell, regulatory path to market, et cetera. But I want to focus on uh, interventions in the supply chain that can actually help us bring the cost of these products down, because I think that's where, I know the question is about behavior change, but I think perhaps changing the behavior of those who might fund uh, alternative proteins upstream uh, is going to be the most important behavior change that, that we can do. Because and I, and I know that folks like ADB uh, are doing great work evaluating this opportunity, right? I think we need to create uh, with alternative proteins, uh, a bankable, well understood asset class that is analogous to solar energy, because what's happened in renewables over the last decades is a fantastic case study and playbook for us to follow here. And we're not going to be able to drive behavior change among consumers unless we're able to drive down the cost of these products and, and have them be available very widely. So, you know, I mean, looking at uh, expanding the pool of investors, the types of investments, the instruments of investment. Uh, to create infrastructure along the value chain. Uh, that's really what I want to endorse as behavior change. And we're looking forward to working with anyone here today on any of these things. I, yeah, I think that's great, Varun. And I might just um, take a little moment to highlight some of the things that my team is able to do on that aspect. So um, one of the challenges that you've talked about is, is I guess, um, engaging with the upstream changes that are required. And so that, um, that includes working with smallholder farmers. And so what we do in, in my team, which is the private sector agribusiness investment team, is working with the companies who are sourcing from smallholder farmers. And often with our um, financing to them, they're providing a technical assistance program to help them um, make the right changes in their um, farming practices to ensure climate resilience, um, et cetera. So it's something that in our team, we talk about a lot. And another thing that I think um, you've touched on sort of financing structures and, and instruments. And I think being able to mobilize um, blended finance to support farmers as well um, is a really important thing that we're trying to do more of in our team. So I'm glad you've highlighted that and I hope nobody minds that I co-opted um, briefly. <laughs> um, I'd like to move on to our one last question, if that's okay, before we move into the audience Q&A. Um, so Singapore was the first country in the world to approve the sale of a cultivated meat. Um, and China's five-year agricultural policy promotes future foods and that includes cultivated meat and microproteins. Um, so what are the challenges to introducing supportive regulation in other countries in Asia? Maybe Isabel, could I ask you? 
I think you may be on mute, Isabel. You might hear me better now. Better. So, um, <laughs> I'm not sure I'm the, best per I'm the best person to answer, but let me try my best. The difficulty in Asia is very much that it's a bi-country process. I think everybody who's tried will tell you we need to go to every local FDA and try to understand the process. So yes, FDA would influence the other countries to some extent, but each country is, is a sovereign country and would take its own decision. So for an innovator, for a startup, even for a large company, it's a very lengthy process and a very expensive one. But if I want, if I may change your question a little bit once again, I'm not so sure the main challenge is a regulatory one. I think these things will happen. FDA is on the track too. Singapore has shown the way. Qatar has approved the commercialization of the first South Carolina meat product. These are still small markets, of course, but as soon as China will step in, it will, of course, change things. I'm not the one to tell when this will happen. I would just like to throw in the discussion the fact that once this is done, it's still a baby step towards consumer acceptance. It is needed. It's an enabler without which nothing will happen. Because as of today, what you can have is you can have people tasting your product, signing a disclaimer in restaurants, but nobody wants to do this on a massive scale. So once we will have the FDAs aligned on saying that cultured meat is good and can be commercialized, I'm still wondering whether we've done the needful for consumers to step on the bandwagon, for which I would like to take the example of GMO in COPS. The communication around GM has been quite bad and the industry is definitely guilty in this. As a result, in many countries, and I can talk about Europe, for instance, this has become a political debate. Voters don't want to hear about GMO, regardless of the merits, and most of them wouldn't even know what is in. We wouldn't like the same situation to happen to clean meat. So what I think is very important is more fundamental research that is not owned by companies, whether they are startup or multinational companies, and transparency. Great, thank you. I saw Varun, you had raised your hand. Can I? <laughs> yeah, I think excellent comments by Isabel. I will say I do want to. I do want to, uh, and this ties in with what Isabel was saying. I want to compliment our colleagues at the Singapore Food Authority. Right? I mean, uh, the the um, the work that they're doing to not just build a regulatory path to market, but build an ecosystem of communication and clarity around these products is I think where a lot of other countries can draw inspiration uh, and look to build a, a similar ecosystem. So Professor Chen has been actually intimately involved with these. There's the Future Ready Food Safety Hub at, at, uh, at NTU, uh, a number of other academic institutes that are involved with studying these novel foods, understanding whether they need uh, novel tests and assays that are used to evaluate their food safety parameters. Uh, a lot of work that's ongoing to convene a consumer research community around these foods and then communicate openly with consumers, uh, inviting consumers to come onto webinars and learn about these foods. I think the this um, this ecosystem that's being built to create clarity around these novel foods is a great step in the right direction. And um, I think we've seen with GMO, as Isabel said, I think the, the initial move was to convey that, oh, this is a life-saving technology without necessarily providing clarity into the process and how things work. And that's not that's not how you can do things in the in the 21st century. It's not how things should be done as well, right? So I think the I think the moves have been in the right direction now. I will say also that the work that's being done at, at SFA with other regulatory authorities like FASANS, Food Standards, Australia, New Zealand, to share uh, knowledge, share data, et cetera, has been very positive. We're seeing it also in places like India where we are able to provide the Indian authorities and other authorities with information coming from these other markets. Uh, and then you have these kind of apex bodies where regulators do share data like Codex Alimentarius out of the FAO WHO, um, where you're able to share all of this data and I think bring more harmonization and knowledge around these things. So, yeah, I mean, the what we want, what we all want is for a clear path to market, for it to be very clear what the, what the, um, the, the risks are, what the, uh, what the tests are, what the pre-market approvals are, and then ideally to not disadvantage something new simply because it's new relative to current industries, right? So I think I think all of these things are steps in the right direction, but there's a long way still to go. 
Great, thank you. I may actually ask William um, to respond to that if that's okay. So William, I think Varun has highlighted the importance of the ecosystem in, in Singapore that you have that's supporting alternative proteins sort of at every step along the way. What's your perspective on the relevance of these changes and this support that Singapore provides for alternative proteins from, a, from the perspective of the regional development? Uh, thanks, thanks, Kate. This is a really uh, uh, important question. Singapore being a, a, a particular in in the in the nature of economy in this size, uh, so I think uh, uh, if we just limit our innovation within Singapore, uh, the impact is really limited. So the idea here is really to play an active role in uh, forging the partnership with uh, with the region. We talk about entire agri-food value chain. So uh, the, uh, the food product development is just uh, the end point. So we ought to, as uh, Varun and the, the other panelists rightly pointed out, we ought to also to work with uh, upstream smallholder farmers and, uh, and, and so that the uh, innovation developed from Singapore can actually benefit other regions and uh, at the same time actually uh, actually benefit Singapore. So as a matter of fact, um, um, we are working with the regional farmers, actually with the help from GFI, to sort of uh, um, uh, help them adopt some of these processing technologies so that they do not just sell the wheat, they don't sell the mung bean or uh, uh, fara, uh, fara beans, but instead they will have a, a better benefit for their livelihood so that the introducing processing technology, this is one of the things. Uh, there are many other areas we can work with uh, regional partners. I think this is a, a role that Singapore can play and, and, and should play so that the, the everyone move uh, ahead together. That's, that's a, that would be the uh, objective, yeah. That's great, thank you. And Isabel, I know that you personally have done a lot to develop the ecosystem of food and ag tech startups in Singapore, um, partly with the objective of developing that ecosystem more broadly in Asia. Is there anything that you would comment on um, in the context of alternative proteins and the Singapore tech startup scene? <laughs> Yeah, when you look at how Asia has evolved, Asia, Asia Pacific, if you allow me to include Australia and New Zealand, it's really interesting. There is a role for every country. At the moment, we speak a lot about Singapore. Australia is equally impressive, equally impressive in what they are developing in terms of innovation. Then you have India, very, very big on alternative crops, very naturally inclined to innovating in that space because it, it's one degree of separation of the vernacular diets. Um, you have two amazing countries starting to develop their own, their own solutions. You have Korea, you have Taiwan, where there is, in Taiwan, there is a very interesting legacy of uh, that vegan food, and the know-how is quite superb there. We spoke about China. Whatever China would decide to do would be a game changer. But even in Thailand, even in more, I would say, unassuming countries in the region, even in Vietnam, it's starting to perspire. It starts with the fundamentals and the assets of a country. If a country has a very solid backbone in biotechnology, then they would be considering precision and fermentation, cultural needs. But if they have just a very booming population and maybe not this tech background, they will be starting from the plant protein space and the distribution space and the advocacy space. So, Interestingly, and I'm not saying this because we've decided to focus our effort on Asia Pacific, but the region is an entire comprehensive ecosystem in that respect. Great, thank you. Um, we actually have some questions from the audience now. Um, so we can start with those. And I'd, I'd love to invite William to join in the Q&A from the audience as well, if that's okay. So the first question that we have is, what innovation um, will be the food or agriculture innovation of the decade in 2021, 2030, and how about after that in 2030, 2050? Maybe, William, could we ask your perspective on that question? Well, um, this is a very good question. Um, 
I, I would say based on our um, uh, involvement in the innovation development, I would say that the uh, food tech actually, um, the, in, term, in terms of uh, developing food technology innovation, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. There are a lot of things is uh, about at applying existing technology into the food space, uh, which means that the, the cost may not be necessarily high. When people talk about tech driven farming, the uh, first thing they have in mind is uh, very, very expensive, uh, which is true in, in, uh, in, in certain cases. But if we, we open our eyes, we look around, uh, there are many ways to lower the cost. For example, we can uh, look at the, how to build the energy efficiency uh, farming system in the urban setup uh, that to lower the cost. And other areas, like uh, when we talk about uh, food, uh, uh, food system development, is the uh, integration of many different ingredients and components. So it's not just look at the, you know, um, uh, for example, plant-based protein, uh, but uh, let's, let's say, for, the, for example, in the case of uh, cultivated meat, uh, one of the ways to lower the cost, uh, for example, is to look uh, for replacement sustainable uh, component for the culture medium. So which is something we have done uh, to replace this uh, bovine serum, uh, 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 fetal bovine serum with our uh, plant-based uh, ingredients. So this is clearly some example that uh, uh, simple innovations can actually help to build this uh, uh, tech-driven food system. So this is currently, I think in, few, in the future, we will see more and more uh, interdisciplinary uh, integration into the, the development of food system. Uh, we are already seeing this uh, in terms of machine learning, IoT, uh, and uh, I would say um, when we have all these expertise on uh, various uh, uh, domain and areas, and uh, food system uh, development will not be something that is too costly. And uh, it's not, we don't really need the rocket science or everything that we do in the food. That's my, uh, my, my, my assessment. That's great. Thanks, William. Varun, I'd love to hear from you. Thank you, Kate. And yeah, I think it's a great question. I just want to, I want to round up Professor Chen's comments as well by saying, um, everything that we're describing right now sounds really exciting, right? There's a lot of money that's gone into alternative protein development and all of the categories are now accelerating, at least in terms of investments. Uh, but nothing we're describing is inevitable, right? It still requires a huge degree of lift from all parties coming together to actually make it a reality. What we actually have in the market right now, let's say in plant-based meats, are a few lovely proofs of concept that can replace burgers and can replace other products that, that are commonly eaten by people, that's still a massive impact, right? So for instance, Americans eat three beef burgers a week, which for all sorts of reasons is really bad. If you replace one of those three beef burgers every week with a Beyond Burger, it's the equivalent of taking 12.2 million cars off the road or powering 2.3 million additional homes. And for the consumer, that's just lunch, right? That's fantastic. But we do have to do a lot of work even within plant-based proteins and plant-based meat to localize, fit into kind of the, I guess, the operating model of, of the global south, work with smallholder farmers, all the excellent work that Isabel, yourselves at ADB, everyone is doing. We need to, I think, scale up this work. And then in the other categories, which may be more of the 2030 to 2050 categories, with cultivated meat, uh, even with some types of fermentation, there's a huge degree of scientific development, infrastructure investment, et cetera, that's still required, right? Just to echo the point from earlier, <clears throat> to echo the point from earlier, excuse me, renewable energy received in 2020 about $500 billion with a B in investment, plus $32 billion of public research funding, right? Whereas alternative proteins have received in history, in our entire history, less than, far less than a billion dollars of public funding for research and about $11 billion in, in venture capital in history. Right? So we're still very much at the infancy of this industry. We're making a lot of noise, but none of what we are saying is inevitable yet. So uh, it's a great question. And I do think we need to take this time frame of 2020 to 2030, 2030 and beyond to actually make this a reality. Yeah, I think that's really good framing, Varun. Thank you. Um, so we have 
four minutes left in our audience Q&A before we move to our closing remarks. Could I ask Isabel and Ian to, to respond to this question? Um, Ian, yes. could you tell us what you think is the innovation of the decade in food uh, for 2021 to 2030 and then after for 2030 to 2050? That's a tough but important question. Um, I think it wouldn't uh, be one of uh, a particular uh, category or sector of, of new technologies, but rather a synergy of technologies. Um, I think uh, if all of these new technologies can be used as in, an, uh, in one place or in, in, in a region, uh, then we can build on the strength of each other. Um, with regards to to um, to cultured meat, uh, as Professor Chen have said, no, I, I, I love I, I love the thought of using um, plant uh, derived amino acids to for the culture media, and we can also use. Uh, a month ago, I heard one of my colleagues uh, is now producing um, protein uh, uh, extracts from insects in Thailand. So that's that's an innovation. But what I would love to see, uh, which is highly critical today, would be how we uh, how we recycle nutrients so that uh, it doesn't go to the ocean. It doesn't kill fish in the ocean and it sustains uh, it is used as a resource not as a waste so pollution will not exist if we are able to harness all these technologies to become uh, uh, resource efficient um, so as well as the uh, if we can really um, enhance biodiversity in, in producing these different um, these different uh, sources of proteins and uh, they say use the waste of insects to, to produce uh, new crops and these crops will some of the amino acids from these crops will be used for for cultured meat and even um, using algae as a source of amino acids for for the cultured meat that would or even cyanobacteria uh, and other photosynthetic algae uh, so and derive some of the vitamins from mushrooms for for the cultured meat you know um these are win-win scenarios so there's uh, for me there's not one groundbreaking um technology uh you know technology of the future but technologies of the future thank you that's great. Thanks, Ian. I love what you say about the importance of increasing the recycling of nutrients. I think that's really um, critical. <laughs> Isabel, would you like to close with your thoughts on what are the techno food technologies of the decade for the current Sorry, decade and for the next two? <laughs> um, let me tell you a short story. Six years ago, when we were putting together the agenda of the first Future Food Asia conference, I reach out to somebody with a fairly big name in the sector. I'm not going to mention his name to not embarrass anybody. And I ask him whether he could lend his weight and come and speak. So he gladly accepted to hop on the call, which I did. And I asked him what he wanted to talk about that would be um, related to food and ag innovation. And he mentioned three projects he was very proud of that were energy projects. And then politely, I told him, yes, but that really doesn't fit in a narrative of food and ag innovation in Asia. He said, yeah, but you should talk about this. And he insisted. And eventually he said to me, you've got everything wrong. You cannot dissociate food from energy. And honestly, in these days, I didn't process the information. It didn't really fit the narrative we wanted to build. It was the first year we needed to be a bit more streamlined in the messaging. We didn't do anything together. But if I have to answer your question in a very straight manner, for me, it's all the notion of food, water, energy, nexus, which is exactly what Varun and Yan was, were saying in a different way. It's all about the integration of the circularity and the 
impact on the different kind of resources food production takes. Because if you think about it, look at controlled environment agriculture, vertical farming, indoor farming in controlled environment. You're trading um, pests and pesticide and input and weeding problem for an energy problem. So these are the two sides of the same coin. And the more we go, the, the more they become the, the two same side, uh, uh, the two sides of the same coin. Precision fermentation, you're trading the in inefficiency of growing an animal to produce meat, to produce uh, cut, to produce, to generate waste that goes to pet food, et cetera, et cetera. You're trading this for a problem, which is energy efficiency. Energy through the energy consumption of the plant, but also through the energy consumption of the building materials of the bioreactors feeding in the plant. So food, water, energy nexus is for me the very big thing. And I think it, keep, it, it can keep us busy until 2050. <laughs> I feel like I'll be busy on this topic. <laughs> thank you. Um, so I'd like to thank our panelists um, and William, very much for joining us today. Your comments have been really interesting. I found it um, a very enriching discussion. Thank you very much for sharing your perspectives. Um, and I'd like to invite um, Martin Lewan, who is the Principal Investment Specialist in my team, he's my manager, um, to share some closing remarks. Martin, are you with us? Yes, Kate. Hi. Hello, <laughs> Hello everyone. Uh, well, thank you for this uh, very enriching session. Uh, it's going to be very hard for me to summarize my takeaways, but maybe very simply from three different perspectives. Uh, one, the consumer. I think Professor Chen mentioned it very upfront. It's a matter of consumer education. Very clearly, there is a need to eat less meat and more pulses, fruits, vegetables, nuts. And the challenge is to make this food uh, tasty, convenient, available, and affordable. And I think if we do that, it doesn't, it doesn't need to be processed food. It can be whole, whole food. Uh, I think if, if, we, if we promote this, I think it will go a long way into uh, shifting consumer preferences. The second perspective will be from the environment. And here, the message is, is rather mixed because we, we've heard from Isabel that there is no point getting rid entirely of the animal uh, proteins because some segments of it are, are fairly efficient and, and have a relatively low footprint. Uh, so it's, it's really a matter of analyzing the entire life cycle and the entire balance in terms of water, energy, uh, and, and food, food balance. And, and for example, insects, as been mentioned, insects is, is, is a very efficient way of producing protein. And it can be used in human food, as, as explained by Ian, but it also can be used to feed fish and livestock. And it can be used as an organic, I mean, the frass of the insects can be used as an, as an organic fertilizer. So it, it's a fairly uh, comprehensive solution. Uh, and that's only one example. Finally, from the perspective of the farmers, and I think that's very important as well, Today, farmers are very incentivized to go into livestock because it's a very attractive uh, business segment for them. More than half of the agri GDP is, is livestock. Uh, so the challenge really for us here is how do we make plant-based proteins as attractive as livestock farming for the farmers? And this is what Varun mentioned. We need to create those bankable business models where money will flow into uh, plant-based proteins uh, at the farming level, at the processing level, and, and up to the consumer. And, and I think uh, it's a challenge for ADB. We have committed to spend $100 billion in climate finance. Let's, let's make sure a big share of it will go into alternative proteins. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much, Martin. Um, that brings us to the end of our session today. I'd just like to um, ask participants um, to complete the short evaluation poll that you'll see on your screen. And again, um, I'd like to offer my thanks to Isabel and Varun and Ian and Professor William Chen for joining us today. Thank you so much for your time and contributions.
Thank you.